Welcome to Not Your Mother's Housing Market, the podcast where we dissect and discuss emerging trends in real estate because a 21st century market requires 21st century strategies. I'm your host, Gabby Graves from Synergy One Lending, NMLS number 2190032, and my guest host for today is... Hi, my name is John Trussell. I'm also with Synergy One Lending. My NMLS is 414164. John, John is a world-renowned loan officer in... Cowlitz County, not just Cowlitz County, right? You've, were you, did you start? I've done a few loans here and there. Here and there. John is my branch manager at Synergy One, and today's podcast is going to be about the media gossip that we hear about today's housing market being similar to the 2008-2007 housing market crash. Um, and since John worked through that time period, I thought that he would be a perfect guest to help maybe debunk some of those myths, maybe tell us the differences between 2007 and current. So let's start off with just some background on you. So tell us about like, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Hobbies, family, all that good yeah. stuff. So I grew up here in Longview. Um, I went to Ari Long and then LCC and then I transferred up to the University of Washington. So in 2000, I got my bachelor's degree in psychology and I was working for the YMCA. Um, so I worked and did all sorts of youth programs, um, adult programs. I joked they used to get paid to play basketball. So it was a ton of fun, a great place to work, great community. Um, and then my wife got into graduate school in San Francisco. And so we moved down to San Francisco and my 24,000 year salary wasn't going to cut it in the Bay area. And so I stumbled into lending, um, Mario, a good friend of mine that worked with me in the YMCA, is like, hey, here's the recruiter for a mortgage company that I worked at, and here I am 20 years later still doing mortgages. So, nice. Yeah, so I started out in San Francisco doing loans. Um, we lived there for three years, and then... Where's the first place you worked for? Um, it's out of business now. It's just a small, small lender. And then I went and worked for a really large bank that rhymes with... Schmelz Schmargo. Schmelz Schmargo? Yeah. So okay. I worked there for nine years. Um, so I went through the entire housing crisis working for the biggest, one of the biggest banks. And when did you start with them? I started with them in 2004. Okay. So definitely through that subprime mortgage height. I did. I did. And it was even in the Bay Area where your average home prices were eight, 900000 I had to compete against these subprime lenders, lenders that offer, offered option arm, negative amortization loans, bank statement loans. Um, so it was a tough competitive market against kind of fighting off those kind of subprime lenders that would do a loan for anybody. Right. And actually, I was looking up some statistics on that. Mm -hmm. And let's see here. Essentially, the private lending sector was much more robust. Um, more than 84% of subprime mortgages were issued through private lending, like you stated. Mm -hmm. So those private lenders, the majority of their business was subprime mortgages. And it seems like, from what I see here, um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, they had about 57% of all loans, all mortgage originations in 2003, but it dropped down to 37% between 2005 and 2006. So that kind of directly shows a good 20% of your market share was taken away by those yeah. private lenders due to subprime mortgages. Yeah, those, most of those companies are out of business. They, they went out of business in 2008 and 9. They were absorbed by other companies. Um, it, was, it was an interesting world to live through, especially in the Bay Area where they had that appetite. I mean, most of the loans I did were three- and five-year arms, very few fixed-rate mortgages. Okay, so real quick, can you explain the difference between an ARM loan and a fixed-rate mortgage? Yeah. yeah. So an adjustable-rate mortgage, or ARM, means that your interest rate's only locked in for a short period of time. That could be anywhere from one year up to 10 years. And then it becomes an adjustable rate. Mm. And so based on your index and your margin, you may have a starting rate at 3 or 4%. And then after that fixed portion, it might go up 3 or 4% and then adjust there on after. Okay. And so... Most of the loans that I did were those three-year, five-year, seven-year adjustable rate mortgages because borrowers wanted to tap into their equity. They knew they'd only be there short term. 
And so they plan to sell the house two or three years down the road before they face that adjustable rate mortgage. Um, and that was a gamble. And not, not a lot of people won that gamble. Um, so when those loans did adjust, we had problems. Home values had gone down. Right. So you may have bought your house for seven, eight, nine hundred thousand, and now it's only worth four. Now they can't refinance. Um, their interest rate went from three or four percent up to six or seven percent. So now it's, it's becoming more stressful to make that mortgage payment, and they can't get out. They didn't want to. They couldn't sell the house because nobody was buying homes in two thousand seven or eight, or very few people were, and so they were stuck with these higher mortgage payments, and they had to weather that storm and try to get through it. So borrowers that were financially responsible and planned for it were fine. The borrowers that were gamblers, that roll of the dice made it really tough for them to, to get through because 2008, the economy was rough, jobs were, jobs were less, that mortgage payment had gone up six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month. It just added another stress to the family and so they made that decision. Do I continue to make my mortgage payment or do I walk away? Um, borrowers that continue to make their payments. There were new programs that the government came out with to help them get out of these adjustable rate mortgages and they were able to weather it and get through it painfully, but they were able to get through it. And at the bank that I worked at, we offered a lot of those programs. So when most people weren't doing loans, I was doing a lot of refinances to get people out of adjustable rate mortgages or higher rate fixed rate mortgages when they were underwater on their home to help them lower their monthly payments and get through all this stuff. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, the government stepped in and helped out with, with what's called HARP, Home Affordable Refinance Program. And and that's what we did from 2008, roughly, to uh, probably 2010, 11. And that was the bulk of your business then? A lot of it was, yeah. Yeah, a few purchases here and there. But again, it just the appetite, the people weren't wanting to buy. They were still a little scarred and jaded from, oh my gosh, I bought a house and it's now I'm underwater. Right. $100,000. So, right. Absolutely. And then I moved home. So in 2008, um, moved back to Longview. That's and then continued to do mortgages and um, and then the market began to shift where people started to kind of see the bottom of the housing market had happened. Interest rates were attractive and people started to buy again and just have been busy busy ever since until 2023 when it's <laughs> interest rates have doubled in the last last two years. So it's a different market. Absolutely. Okay. So you, you were, you lived in the Bay area, you moved back in 2008. Yep. Yep. So did, were you still working for Schmelz Schmargo I was. Yeah, I was. in 2008? Yep. I worked okay. there nine years. Um, and then in 2011, things tightened up. They really weren't geared towards purchase business. And so I shifted and, and left Wells Fargo and I, I worked at Guild Mortgage for nine years, opened up an office here in town, um, and really focused on purchase business. Awesome. So, and very few, re I mean, you would still refinance a few people here and there, but most of my business was, was people buying homes. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And then you branched out and started Synergy. Yeah, when did so you open the Synergy branch? Coming up on two years. So in September. Awesome. Um, so September 21, I opened up the office here in town and um, just really started to focus on transparency and trying to write loans that were better for borrowers and um, speed and using some technology to help us get loans done faster, um, all within the bounds, the, the same playing field that we all have to play in because there's a few regu few regulations with mortgages here and there. Just a few. So, only a few. Yeah. We only have to recite our identification number every time we do this podcast. <laughs> you know, I'll probably know that number for the rest of my life. Yes. I noticed your number is one digit less than mine. Okay. So I, I don't... <laughs> You have a seven-digit number? Yeah, you've yeah. you've been in the industry a little bit longer than me. It made me chuckle when I – I didn't know yours, so when I typed it out, I was like, oh, John's is really short. Um, okay, so I was thinking about where I was during the 2006, 2007 housing market crash and where I was during the 2008 financial crash. So – 2006, 2007, I was in high school. So I was actually going, I was in the running start program at LCC and I was studying accounting there. So 
it was a very interesting perspective to hear what was going on, the lax lending rules and practices, I would say, at least that's the way it was taught to me, that led to this housing bubble. Um, and then in 2008, I was attending LCC, finishing my associate's degree. And again, I was in school for accounting. Um, I went to Western after and got my bachelor's in accounting. And so my classes really on, from an accounting perspective, dug deep into how risky um, and just the predatory lending side of things. So where where were you in during this time, 2006, 2007, and how, like, what was your perspective on it? Because mine was more of this, well, how could this happen? How, how are there not rules in place to stop people from doing this? Because I only know what I know. So right, yeah, right. where were you and what was your perspective? So in 2006, I was working in San Francisco um, and... Selling those arms. A lot of adjustable rate mortgages. I did a few loans for friends here in Washington. At the bank, when I was bank, you weren't you did not have to be licensed. So I didn't oh. have an NMLS ID. I didn't have a state or a federal license. Right. I had a social security number and a, and a heartbeat. That's, <laughs> that's the, that was regulation then. Anybody right. Anybody could do loans. Um completely different today. So in 2006, my wife and I moved back. So it was 2000, let's think, she graduated in 06. So in July of 2006, we moved back to Longview. I played hooky for about four months and fished and helped my parents landscape their new home that they built. Um, so I really kind of took a little three-month sabbatical. I was still employed by the bank and closing business, but I really wasn't doing much. I was goofing off for a couple months. Um, and then I got back on the horse and continued to write mortgages. Um, we bought our first house in January of 2007. At okay. The peak, yes. Which you think I'm an idiot for doing it, but it was cheaper to buy a house than it was to rent. Okay. We wanted a dog. Most renters can't have pets. And so we bought a house. Um, I locked my rate at six and a half percent. I did a 3% down payment conventional mortgage. We bought our house. And then I watched it drop $100,000 in value. So I continued to make my mortgage payment. I was in a fixed rate mortgage. Yes, I could have just walked away from it, um, but that's not me. Right. So I signed the obligation. I'm going to stick with it. I own the house today. Um, still own it. Um, it's probably worth double what I paid. Um, and I have a renter in there. So it's, it was my first became my first rental property. Nice. Um, so, so you bought January of 2007. Yep. You watched the price decline at $100,000 in value. Absolutely. But yeah. here you are 17 years later. You still own the home, and it's doubled in price. Yeah, I think if if I were to list it with a realtor, they'd probably ask twice about what I paid. Awesome. So, but I have a renter in it. They're awesome. They've been there nine years. Wonderful people. They help maintain the house. I don't raise their rent. I, they're just really wonderful people. Um, so I'm lucky that I have good renters, even through COVID. They right. continue to make their mortgage payment uh, or rent payment so I could continue to make my mortgage payment. Nice. Um, and it'll be paid off in eight years. So I'll have this brand, this asset that's owned free and clear. It's a great source of residual income for me. I could leverage it. I could let my kids live in it. I could sell mm -hmm. it, pay for college. Um, I'll just have some kind of cool options but now that I have a rental property. So. Nice. So yeah, I just continued to make the payment. We lived there, and then I bought our my current house um, nine years ago. Okay. And so um, at a great time because my interest rate is well under three percent. I don't want to tell you. <laughs> well under three yeah. percent. Um, no, but so. it's interesting to hear your perspective that you purchased a home at the height of the market at six and a half percent. I think that, but you're still saying it was a good purchase. It was a good choice. Um, it has added to your personal wealth. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you continued making the payments. I think there were, you could also afford to make the payments. I think that there's some people in back in 2007 with the adjustable rate mortgages, they really just became priced out. And so back to the lending standards and practices, what are the differences between then and now where that's where I guess I don't want to like, I don't want to tell the answer before you answer it, but it's not as common for us to use adjustable rate mortgages right now. It's not as common for us to maybe 
have some of these same practices. Right. You know, back then, people got into adjustable rate mortgages because the payment was more affordable. Okay. They looked at a fixed rate loan that was here and an adjustable rate that was here, and they went, well, let's do the adjustable rate. I can save four or $500 a month in payment. Right. That's a big difference. It moves the needle um, on their monthly budget. Huge. Today, that needle is almost identical. So I've only done maybe three or four adjustable rate mortgages in the last five years. It's very few. So question about that. The needle you said is about the same. Is that because in 2006 and prior, you could qualify people on the starting rate, where now you have to qualify people on the permanent rate? Or not the permanent rate, but above, the adjusted. Yeah, 5% above. That's what you'd have to qualify them on. So it's, it's... you got to qualify, period, right. hands down. Right? So, Today. Back so then, you had a job, you had income, you met the requirements, you could get the loan. So back then, if you, say, were getting an adjustable rate mortgage, mm-hmm. you had to afford the payment at the initial interest rate. They underwriting didn't look at whether or not you would be able to afford the payment debt-to-income ratio-wise right. at other rates, yep. where now they do. Correct. Okay. So now... Adjustable rate, adjustable rate mortgages don't look any cheaper, really, than fixed rates. For, right, that's for sure. Um, it can be cheaper per month, but the differences in the rates between arms and fixed rate today is very small. Okay. So, you know, you just have to do it for the right reasons, and really, the only reason I can think of is because you're going to pay it off the next couple of years. Okay. Whether you sell a house, um, retire, and, and you have a lump sum of money set aside to pay this thing off. That's the buyer that has the ability and the plan moving forward to pay that thing off before it adjusts. Right. Because most likely it'll adjust higher, not lower. Right. So. Okay. Okay. And do you feel like just overall with like lending practices, do you feel like you you stated that before there was no licensing requirements. So do you feel like now with the licensing requirements that just generally – loan officers in practice are being much more transparent in what what they're offering their buyers, affordability, I th- early yeah. payoff, penalty, all those kinds of things? Yeah, I think so. It gives us an understanding of this is a licensed person originating my loan. So they've they passed an FBI background check. They've been fingerprinted. They probably haven't had a bankruptcy or foreclosure. Um, they check our credit. Right. I mean, it's... You know, to be employed in the mortgage world, it's it's not difficult, but there's steps you have to go through. And putting the right people in that place to help borrowers be able to counsel them and coach them. And this is where I lean into my, you know, my background of working with people from every economic background you can imagine, is you have to relate to these people. You know? Right. So, you know, and I want to hear their stories and I want to like them and I want them to become part of my family. And that's kind of the beauty of this job is we get to know people and help them make this huge financial decision that we know will lead them towards a better path and more wealth and whether they buy one house or five houses. Right. So it's it's a great feeling. Yeah. Um, But yeah, lending standards are way different. Continuing education. You know, I have licenses in three states, so I have to do my continuing ed for all those states. Um, I wasn't, didn't have to do any of that when I worked at a big bank. Interesting. That's so wild to me because that's all I've ever known. I mean, not that I have this like fast experience, but that's all I've ever known. So it's interesting yeah. hearing you say that it used to just be like, here's your loan. <laughs> here's no rules. Wild, wild west. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So that goes for lending real estate after 2008. Mm-hmm. What, how did you, what did, what did you see going on in home prices 2009 to 2012? Um, things had kind of bottomed and we didn't know when it was going to be, begin to go up. Um, interest rates were good. The people that could refinance were refinancing, getting their monthly payments lower. They weren't taking equity or cash out, but they were just getting lower monthly payments. So we're getting a better solid base to begin to build. 2011, 12, I think you started to see that appreciation. Home values start to tick up to a normal 3 to 5% appreciation a year, which is normal okay. and healthy. Right. Um, so home started to, you kind of saw that trajectory is beginning to move up. And so people began to buy again. Okay. Um, and 
we started doing first time home buyer programs. I, I got my certificate with Washington Bond in 2007. So really started to focus on helping first time home buyers get back into the market. Um, and it's just been busy ever since. Um, there's no like unicorn loan out there that's great for first time home buyers. Um, they have to put some skin in the game, whether they pay their own closing costs, whether they come in with a down payment, um, but they got to qualify. They got to have a debt to income ratio, a good credit score. Um, or, you, I mean, like you, we work with them. We help them get there. Right. That might take six months, a year. I've had borrowers that two years later are ready to purchase. Right. That's a pretty good feeling. Absolutely. Because so. it does. It takes time to work on your credit. Yeah. It takes time to pay off your debts. Um, and those are huge factors in qualifying for a loan. And so, like John said, there's no unicorn loan that you can qualify for without the proper income, without the proper employment. Um, was that something that existed prior to 2006? You could. You could get a bank statement loan where we just add up all your deposits. Oh. Divide that by 12 months, and that's your monthly income. Right. You could do, there were stated income or what used to be called NINA, no income, no asset loans, where they just looked at Gabby. She's got a pulse and a credit score. Here's your loan. You come in with your down payment. So um, basically how believable you are to the right. lender, just yeah. how good you sell it. So. Wow. At a big bank. And those were subprime mortgages, Those were right? subprime mortgages. Okay. Yeah. And those were extremely profitable for banks to do. They were extremely profitable loan officers. They pushed them. The bank that I worked at, we didn't have those type of products. We didn't have option arms. Um, and they weathered the storm. They made it through. Um, when I was at Guild Mortgage, they didn't offer subprime loans. And so they made it through. So, you know, working with a good lender isn't just you and I. It's a good company that has that integrity to get us through these times and to stand by the loan that they write. So. Okay. Yeah. Do you, as far as our current market is concerned, um, people are saying that we're headed towards another housing market crash, similar to 2006 and 2007. What is your take on that? I mean, I wish I could predict the future. I know. I mean, that would make our job really easy. probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about mortgages. <laughs> so... Um, 50% of the people are going to be right. 50% are going to be wrong. So you might as well flip a coin. I will just tell you, and I, you and I talk about this all the time, you buy when you're ready. Right. Period. You, you've got to be comfortable with the mortgage payment. You're budgeted. You're strong. Um, and again, you just it goes back to you buy at a price point that you're comfortable with, a monthly payment, and when you're ready. Right. And if that's not today, that's okay. Let's help you get ready. We can help make a path forward. Mm -hmm. I always like to say to people, it's it's not, you know, it's not a race. We're going to get there eventually. And really what I specialize in, and John as well, is I love on my borrowers. So if you're not ready now for whatever that reason is, maybe the monthly payment doesn't feel affordable to you, we're going to help you create a path forward on that. Maybe we write a budget together. Maybe yeah. we talk about other employment options you could have to get a raise or some work goals. somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. It'll get you there. Yeah. So, um, but back to your question, it's hard to buy today. First time home buyers are in a tough situation. Absolutely. You know, you have home prices here, you have interest rates even up here. Um, you got to go back to those fundamentals is, are you ready? Is this payment comfortable to you? Because once you own a house, you're stuck with it. Right. When that roof goes out or the water heater fails, you can't call me and I can't pay for it. Right. I'd love to, but you got to be able to budget and be prepared for that stuff because owning a home isn't cheap. Right. Um, but in the long run, it pays huge dividends. It's an asset that will continue to grow. It may drop down in value, but in the long run, overall, real estate is a great investment. Um, and it's a stable place for you to raise your family. Right. So, One thing I really kind of heard you say today, um, going back to just trying to predict the future, it seems like while we can't say and predict whether or not there will be a housing market crash, it doesn't seem like if there is, it won't be for the same reasons. Yeah. You know, um, it looks agree. a lot of that <clears throat> lacks, um, lacks lending requirements by LOs, is loan officers, as well as um, 
the appetite the financial industry had for some prime mortgages and bundling them into derivatives, um, we've kind of seen the fallout of that. And so some of that hunger has gone away and we try to stay much more within, you know, conforming loan limits. You know, a lot of loans, 70%, as I stated before, 70% of mortgages right now are backed with Fannie and Freddie. So that's according to the National Association of Realtors. So that means that, you know, the vast majority of loans are going to be those fixed rate mortgages, um, conventional mortgages or FHA, but they're not going to be adjustable rate mortgages. Right. They're not going to be subprime NINA loans where you don't right. have to They're show income. They're not going to have prepayment penalties where if you paid off early, you have to give 2% of your principal balance. Right. I mean, I've seen I've seen prepayment penalties that exceed twenty or $30,000 just to refinance out of it. Wow. So that stuff doesn't exist in the Fannie, Freddie, HUD world. Right. Um, subprime loans are out there still. There are. You got to be aware, you know, leery of them, but there's still private lenders that are mm-hmm. doing subprime mm-hmm. loans. Yeah. But as we stated, they account for so much less of the total percentage of our mortgage mortgages yeah. in the United States. So it seems like our mortgage market is more stable in that regard. It is. Yeah. And you know, we're in a real volatile mortgage rate world mm-hmm. where we've seen rates move up significantly. They're starting to calm back down. Again, I don't own a crystal ball. Our hope is that rates will begin to calm down and people could refinance that have these high rates. But bottom line is you got to be comfortable with the payment that you take today because there's no guarantee so Absolutely. that it's going to be lower. Your property taxes are probably going to go up. Right. Your homeowner's insurance is probably going to go up. Which means your monthly mortgage payment will slightly go up because your yeah. escrows are higher. Yeah. I think that's something that people don't actually know. That's something I like to have conversations about with my borrowers is you do have a fixed interest rate mortgage. And this will, your principal and interest will not change. Right. But your property taxes and homeowners insurance could go up, which would mean that your total payment could adjust a little. Yeah, you're going to open up that bill in September and your heart's going to skip a beat. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I have to pay my taxes. Most people include that with their mortgage payment. Right. So they don't have to pay it, but taxes are going up. So, you know, those pressures are there and things are more expensive today. So be prepared. Um, You're not going to see hundreds of dollars a month difference in your payment. You might see $30, $40 difference, but that's, uh, it adds up every month. So, okay. Okay. I have one more prediction question for you because I know that you are a big Seahawks fan. (laughs) <laughs> what is your prediction for the Seahawks this season? Man. I'm uh, going to take this to the a and No, I'm just kidding. Yes. I, <laughs> we, uh, you highly advise your clients to gamble on sports. <laughs> I never do. I am so risky verse. I don't even, I don't know how to play the lotto. The first time I bought a lotto ticket, I'm still confused. I don't really understand how to do it. I don't find any fun in scratch-offs or... Nothing, nothing at all. Bingo's fun. That's about as yeah, spicy bingo. as I get in yeah. the gambling realm. So, um, I I'm I'm excited. I think they made some great draft picks. Okay, I think we're gonna have a the Legion of Boom is coming back stronger. Um, I think the Seahawks will go four and one to start off the season. Okay. So I think uh, if we get like eighty to ninety percent of Geno Smith from last year, this year, I, I think the Seahawks win the NFC West. I do. I think they are uh, they're a tough team. We do have a tough, tough schedule. I mean, we got the Eagles coming towards the end of the week or end of the end of the year. Okay. We're playing the 49ers on Thanksgiving Day in Seattle. Ooh, that'll be fun. Okay. Which, which I'm excited for Thanksgiving. There's been some awesome <laughs> awesome 49ers Seahawks game. I mean, that rivalry is back. Did um, you used to like the 49ers when you lived in California? <laughs> You know, I, I never we went tell. to a game. I know. <laughs> I, I did used to walk Kizar Stadium, okay. which is where they used to play. Um, that was about a mile from our house. So when I was, I would just go walk and kind of relive your glory days of, I mean, I didn't play football. I should have. You coach, didn't play football? No, the coaches were so mad at my brother and I. I have an identical twin brother. So to have two six foot four guys. Yeah, not, no kidding. Not on the football team. Yeah, we were just too nice. <laughs> I don't really have an angry bone in my body. Um, but, yeah, it was fun to cruise around Keysar Stadium. I hate the 49ers. Did you wear your Seahawks jersey as you walked laps around the stadium? <laughs> no. That would have been fun. No, I get, I get ousted. They would chase me. The 49ers <laughs> fans are tough. I did get to go to Candlestick Park the last game of the year when they played the Seahawks. 
and I made it out alive. So Barely. Yeah. So we're going to beat the 49ers. We're going to beat them Thanksgiving Day in Seattle. Um, yeah, I would. I, my prediction is the Seahawks will win the NFC West. Okay. You heard it here first on Not Your Mother's Housing Market. So. Okay. Maybe we'll turn this into our new little bit. We'll take Seahawks predictions through the end of the Just year. phone me in. Next, yeah. Your next one, when Katie's back, I'd be like, here's your pick this week. Yes. Seahawks are beating the Browns. Okay. Oh. All right. That'll be our new little shtick. Okay. Yeah. Well, John, it was super fun having you today. Thanks. I appreciate this you is, being this my is guest. This a first host. for me, so hopefully my face for radio isn't too bad. Oh, I mean, you're All right. you got the face. If it that is, we all I'm just going to blame my twin brother. If Jim did the podcast with you. <laughs> I don't know how compliance will take that. <laughs> Jim, the 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 firefighter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you guys actually real quick before we go? Did you guys ever? Pretend to be each other and switch classes? Of course not. Once. Really? Yeah, once in middle school. Um, close twice. I almost ran. So I, did, I played tennis, and my brother did track and field, and I was going to go run the, <laughs> what's called. They took all the throwers, so javelin, shot put, discus, and they called it a weight man's relay. Okay. And I was always faster than my brother. Oh. And so during a varsity meet, we planned it. He was going to come over to the tennis court. I was going to go run the track event for him. And Mr. Guglamo, who's he's retired now, <laughs> he probably won't listen to this. He looked at me and he goes, I know you're not Jim. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, sh-. And so I quickly switched with my brother. So it worked in middle school, not so much in high school. No, probably not so much now either. I don't know if we want Jim originating loans or you. I don't want to drive a fire, fire truck. No. I mean, I've had borrowers that think I'm my brother. I thought I showed up at their house because they had a 911 call. And, <laughs> did. and no, that's, I, yes, I could do CPR if I had to, but nowhere nearly effective as the Long Beach Fire Department guys. So, nice. So yeah, I'll. Maybe we'll have Jim on sometime as a guest. That'd be fun. <laughs> Have to get some John stories out of Jim. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, John. Thank you. This is the fifth episode. I'm stumbling over my words. This is the fifth, fifth episode of Not Your Mother's Housing Market. My name is Gabby Graves with Synergy One Lending, NMLS number 2190032. And I am John Trussell with Synergy One Lending. My NMLS is 414164. Thanks for having us. Have a great day, everybody.